to get started. Everybody's like, okay, this is cool, but not that cool. Apart from John, who's totally cool. Okay, should we start? Let's start. All right. You're up. So <clears throat> I'm going to boot this off because I, I sort of started shellfish, but I sort of reaping the, uh, the benefit of it without really doing anything. These guys are actually the brains behind it and the guys that stayed up all night doing all the work. I'm just looking at them thinking, oh my God, I remember when I did that. 25 years ago. Giovanni did a lot of high-level planning and sushi delivery. Exactly. That's my role. Feed them. They will poop software. Okay. <laughs> Cyber Grand if you Challenge. you look at our code, that's really actually true. That's actually true. So uh, I, I'm going to be very short on this. Um, Shellfish was born out of the SAC Lab, which is the security group at UC Santa Barbara. Every time you say UC, people say University of California. That's not right. That's Berkeley. UC Santa Monica. That does not exist. It's UC Santa Barbara. So get it right. SAC Lab is the group. That's where we come from. And uh, the group is led currently by me and my um, uh, colleague, Christopher Krugel. Uh, we look very professional here, like professors, but it's we're actually hackers behind weird handles like everybody else. I, I never got the handle thing, but I, I needed one. And so if you look about Zanardi on the, on the internet, it's somebody with a gigantic nose and a ponytail, which I once had. Giovanni, would you say Chris is your life partner? I think Chris me, uh, Chris me, <laughs> Christopher is my academic wife. So I, I have to take care of all his needs and his, uh, I wish he would be here. He would be very, he's super proud of everybody. But this is our university, not bad. And that's why Shellfish is here. Our lab is exactly there where there were arrow points. We're all right on the beach. We have a private beach. And that's why our tagline is Hex on the Beach. Um, uh, we're lucky. Might that be way. back here. Is it back here? Yes, it is, it is, it All is. right. So how did it start? It started in 2004. I know it's incredibly, such a long time ago. Uh, it's me, but then I had a bunch of uh, grad students, including Chris, uh, and we evolved into uh, a community, and in 2005, we actually won DEFCON CTF. Never won since then. That was the good old days. And it's, all, it's awesome because they say the older you get, the more awesome you wear. Uh, so I'm, I'm milking it for whatever I can. But we grew up, you know, and then suddenly Void, Chris, moved to Vienna, became a professor there, recruited some more people that became more people that came back to Santa Barbara because it's awesome, became more people, more students, more students, even more students, and... What happened is that some people went to Boston. So we have a substantial presence in Boston, and we evolved as a group more and more in the years. Until at a certain point, all our gradu graduate students actually became professors as well. And so a lot of you, you know, UC people became professor all around the world, in London, at the Arizona State University, Eurocom in France, and right now, Shellfish is a very big group of all academic people all around the world doing interesting stuff. So right now, our group is pretty much this. We're very inclusive. We're, you know, we foster research, and that's what we care about. And with this, I'll give my presentation baton to Jan. Thank you, Giovanni. So before we go on with uh, the Cyber Grand Challenge itself, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, all the other shellfish in the audience. So raise your hand if you're a shellfish. Oh yeah, right there. Nice. Nice. Yeah, shellfish is uh, bigger than just the CGC team. The CGC team is a strict subset, but we have a lot of uh, people that were cheering us from the sidelines even on the team. So let's talk about the Cyber Grand Challenge. Um, DARPA has a history of grand challenges, right? 
you guys are probably familiar with the self-driving car grand challenge and the robotics grand challenge because uh, they got a lot of press similar to the cyber grand challenge just now. And uh, the idea behind these is DARPA finds this fledgling technology, self-driving cars, uh, and they fund it with a lot of money, right? So there are prizes, million dollar prizes for uh, self-driving cars, and this motivated a lot of people to put a lot of research into it. At the time, people were of course saying, because the time was 2006 when we didn't even have smartphones, and people were saying, do you really think that someday you'll be sitting inside a computer and it'll be driving you around? That's absurd, and now we have people driving themselves to the hospital while they're having a heart attack in their Tesla. And so, you know, this technology push really pays off. And it's probably going to be the same with robotics. DARPA did the robotics cybergun challenge, and probably in 10 years, we're all going to be dead. <laughs> and it's also going to be the same with programs. So the cybergun challenge really pushed the frontier of automatic program analysis, exploitation, and defense. Right now, it's in its infancy. I think uh, we'll see how the CRS did at DEF CON CTF, uh, but maybe they won't beat the best humans. But that's the beginning. The chess systems didn't beat the best humans, and the self-driving cars aren't going to beat the best humans in races right now. But eventually they will, and eventually mechanical fish will kill us all, or hack us all, while the actual robots kill us. So that's the Cyber Grand Challenge. Um, let's talk about Shellfish's involvement in the Cyber Grand Challenge. As Giovanni said, Shellfish is a bunch of academics and hackers, right? So we're kind of hackademics. So um, at one point, we decided to shift our research uh, interests in, uh, at UCSB closer to binary analysis, right? We started looking into uh, doing automated binary analysis and all of the things along with that, automatic vulnerability discovery and so forth, completely independent of the Cyber Grand Challenge. We started doing this sometime in 2013, and in late 2013, DARPA announces the Cyber Grand Challenge, right? And so I have an email somewhere in my history saying, hey guys, check this out, this is this cool thing, maybe you should participate because we're working on a lot of the same stuff. And everyone said, yeah, let's do it, let's go for it. And I said, great, and then promptly forgot about it for like a year. Right, so the deadline for registration was in late 2014. I sent in the kind of uh, application literally 15 seconds before the deadline because that's, that's how we roll. And they uh, said, great, you're in, congratulations. Uh, let's, you know, see what you got. The first court event is coming up in like four months. And so we were like, okay, cool, oh no, like, on the graph is like in one month, right? So we said, cool, let's, let's build a CRS. We're gonna, we're gonna rock the scored event, the, the first kind of practice round, that, that was the term DARP used for them, scored events. So the first practice round, uh, we, were gonna, we were gonna do super awesome, we were gonna kill it, and we totally forgot about it. The morning of the practice round, I wake up, and I'm like, shit, there's a practice round for the, the CGC stuff tonight. And so we started working on our CRS, right? So the first commit to the CRS is two hours, maybe three hours, let's say, before the practice round begins, right? So we start writing our CRS, practice round begins, we play the practice round with some janky ass CRS that, that kind of half works. Cool. So then we're like, all right, well, now we, we started, we're gonna get it all super put together before the second practice round. Second practice round rolls around, and now we remember about it maybe three days before, right? So the second commit to the CRS happens three days before the second practice round. We uh, build it up, build it up, build it up, play in the second round, say, okay, cool. Now we have this uh, kind of cyber reasoning system that's uh, kind of ready to play in the CQE if we keep working on it solidly until the uh, qualifiers. And then, of course, we forget about it for another couple months. And then, Two and a half weeks before the qualifiers, we remember, hey, wait a second, the qualifiers are coming up. So then we start working like crazy and not sleeping. Three weeks of complete insanity until the Cyber Grand Challenge qualifiers, and we have a cyber reasoning system 
that we can field for the Cyber uh, Grand Challenge qualifiers, and we qualify with three weeks of absolute insanity. And so then we figured, cool, now A, we're super rich, because the qualifiers came with $750,000 of prize money, and B, we can now spend a year working solidly, right, solidly, with test cases, test cases, test cases. Test cases. code freezes, milestones, mm, milestones, Lots of milestones and absolutely, you know, continuous uh, integration, integration and, 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 you know, test uh, rounds and everything for an entire freaking year. Agile development. Agile development. That's, that's the key word here. None of that happened. <laughs> so for uh, nine months, we uh, used our money to fly around the world giving conference talks and, like, saying how, how cool we are and how, you know, Fish is a, is a Chinese martial arts expert, or wait, that was, that was Kevin. <laughs> Kevin's a Chinese martial arts expert, and, you know, Antonio's mysterious, and all this shit, but it really, what we should have been doing is working on the CRS, right? And three months before the uh, finals, three months ago, we realized this, and we're like, crap. We should really write a CRS, for real, actually, right? Like, I mean, we should take what we had in quals and actually, like, you know, extend it so it can win finals. So three months ago, we, we started working like crazy. We, we stopped sleeping, right? I have a fiance, and I haven't seen her in three months, basically. That, that's, you know, the insanity. To the founding agency that are listening, we're a lot more responsible than it looks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah th 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 this is our hacker persona, right? We also have an academic persona where of course we have CI, of course, come on. Who doesn't have CI? And code freezes, right? And we, we finish all our papers two weeks before they're due so that our professors can uh, go over them and absolutely. This, this is the hacker shellfish persona. Lights. Lights. <laughs> all right, anyways. So we went crazy for three months. We got uh, the final commit to the CRS 30 minutes before the air gap was established. 30 minutes. All right, and it was a commit in one of the core components, so shit could go wrong. There's a slide for that. And, all right, I'm killing us. So, we did it. We played the CAGC, we got third, and this is the team that we already introduced. We're from all around the world, Italy, Germany, the US, India. There was a guy uh, qualifying with us who's hopefully sitting in the uh, audience from Senegal, uh, fish is from China. We are from all, all over the place. And we are very rich because we got two $750,000 prizes now. So that's kind of a brief intro to our involvement in the CGC. I'll pass it off to Jacopo to introduce the CGC as a platform and what it means. Right, so let's thank Jan for a very, very very true and very effective introduction to the Shellfish Hacker, very distinct from academia, very distinct yeah. from the Shellfish Academy. Uh, right, so just very briefly, so what does it mean to actually score well in the CGC? You have to, you're gonna go blind with binaries that you have never seen before. You have to analyze them in whatever way you want. There's no limitation on how you do it. You have to own them either by a crash or by leaking a secret and you also have to patch them so that the other guys cannot do the same to you. And this is a classic, um, classic CTF uh, structure that has some modifications to decree in, in the decree operating system to make it more, modable, more easier to model and easier to handle for a, for a program, okay? So one of the simplifications is that, uh, so the architecture is Intel x86, all opcodes are legal, which can lead to interesting situations that we will see in a, in a bit. Um, Sys calls are simplified, much easier to model, pretty much read and write, select, uh, allocate, deallocate, like malloc and free, random and obviously exit. A lot easier to model for a program. And the actual binaries are actually a lot, a lot more realistic, uh, are very real, they're not uh, complete fake binaries. So as a side note, the DEFCON CTF just finished. And the DEFCON CTF was also played on the same platform, so just as an example of how 
real and complex these binaries could be. One of the challenges in the DEF CON CTF was a PowerPC interpreter and jitter, which was awful. So there's a lot of room for complexity in these programs. And on the actual pawning side, um, I don't know if some of you guys want to barge in, but basically what it means is that there is no, there is no state. Every program runs once, there is no state. It runs, you either own it or it's gonna do its thing. There's no, uh, there's no state, there's no file system to modify. This is a lot easier to, to model. For the, for the qualifications and only for the qualification, it was just enough to crash the program. Sec fault, illegal instruction, you would get the points. You have owned the binaries. For the finals, things are a lot more nuanced and the actual exploitation, as we will see, is a lot, uh, is a lot more complicated and it's a very interesting application of how to use symbolic execution and static analysis. Uh, but as, as a, as a basic idea, the two ways you do is either via a control crash, in which you can show that you can not only crash the program in some place, but you can actually crash the program at a place that the API, the DARPA is gonna tell you, please crash the program in this place and set this register to this value. If you can do that, you verify that you have actually control of the program, or alternative that you can leak a secret flag from memory. And on the patching side, just a, a brief note on how you analyze, how this API is designed so that it does not become too easy. Like for instance, we can submit patches to the binary, okay? So what is preventing us from just submitting a binary that just exits, okay? These programs, this program obviously never crashes, but it also does not do anything useful. So the way this is prevented is, is that there are functionality checks. If you, if the program does not maintain its benign function, if the program is a math calculator, it needs to still be able to do all the math operation that it can do normally. And similarly, there is no signal handling, so no way to just hide away all the seg faults. If you seg fault, you are crashing. And finally, how would prevent us from putting in an interpreter that runs everything, so checks before every possible instruction, am I gonna crash, am I gonna crash? Obviously you will never crash. And the way this is prevented by DARPA that you can actually do it, you can do it if you want, but you're gonna pay a performance price, you're gonna lose points for performance. This is, believe me, not as easy as it sounds. Understanding exactly how your patch is performing is definitely not an easy task, Many of us looked into it, I looked into it a bit, Antonio looked into it in a bit, in a bit. It's definitely pretty hard. And then we gave up testing performance. We just say, this is our patch, deal with it. <laughs> yes, yes, that's very true. And, and I, you know, informally we know other teams also had trouble, but I think none more than Aravind knows very well how much of a pain, how much of a big pain it can be to actually test the performance and the functionality of binary. So big props to Arvin for actually pushing through this task and actually making it. And this actually helped us a lot during our, our own internal testing, even if it did not go into the live part. And I will now hand over. Somebody, just go. Somebody. Somebody. All right, so the uh, CQE for the qualifying event was not the full, no, it was not the full cyber grand challenge. It was, you needed to patch binaries and you needed to crash binaries. You didn't need to exploit anything, you just needed to crash it. The final event, you need to patch binaries, crash binaries to find where vulnerabilities are and then exploit those vulnerabilities. And on top of that, it wasn't just a simple game or a simple program challenge where you got a binary and you crashed it. It was a game. So you had to have a game theoretic aspect that uh, played against other actual competitors, right? Similar to a human CTF, but all with computers. Um, so the competition was actually divided into 96 rounds. Uh, and that wasn't predetermined. It was, you know, however many rounds they got through in a day. Uh, there was a minimum time per round, and that ended up being 96. 
Uh, and there was a bunch of uh, challenge binaries, as they term, uh, as DARPA terms them, uh, which were provided to the teams to hack. And for each score, for each round, the team would have a separate round score that, when aggregated, would be their total score for the game. The score was calculated based on a multiplication of the team's availability, which means how much did they fuck up the binary and how fast the binary still was, right? How much overhead the patches had, which is something uh, Yakpo alluded to. The security score, which is how exploitable were the binaries still, or were they still exploitable? And the valuation score, which means did we find, did the team find an exploit for this binary? So it was very easy to screw yourself in this context because it, they're all multipliers. If you completely break the binary, even if you have perfect offense, if you, even if you find all of the exploits for this binary, then you still get zero points because you broke the binary. In developing for this competition, we uh, ran into a lot of kind of uh, organizational things, as I alluded to earlier. We started super late. So for example, up until depressingly short time ago, this was our database. All right. After all, this is a research group run by an Italian. Yes. Again, this is our hacker persona. So we actually had to do a join on this database at one point. When we uh, got the real database up, we were joining between the paper database and the actual database. This is relevant because it's about our performance scores. This addresses the database of our performance scores we're trying to analyze. That's yeah. how it's relevant to the previous slide. Specifically, this database contains the feedback from some uh, practice sessions for the final event. So this is what DARPA called sparring partner sessions. We wrote them down, and then we had to join them with the real database to get the actual information that we needed to tune our patches. Uh, we also tried to go into code freeze several times. So at 4.01 p.m. on some godforsaken day, uh, we froze a component of our uh, CRS called Farnsworth. Uh, and very shortly thereafter, this is the commit log. Right? So the code freeze didn't work very well. Um, there are commits such as this gem here. <laughs> so that, that, that's Francesco here. The, the, you know. Beautiful, beautiful code. Th this commit was okay, actually. He just has very high standards. Actually, it was probably crap, but yeah. Um, and then, of course, this is uh, a long time into our code freeze, 12, uh, 15 hours before our nodes were shut down a couple of days ago. We were still changing very core components of the system. That's me upside down. I was, at this point, no longer sane. So. Our uh, CRS consisted of a lot of components, right? We had a um, what's going on? We had a central database that we called Farnsworth, for some reason, uh, which stored all of the data that uh, we got from the uh, CyberGAN Challenge API through a component that uh, we'll talk about later. Uh, it stored network uh, captures. It uh, made, uh, it stored the scheduling decisions of what jobs to run, and then it stored the result of those jobs. So now we're gonna go one by one into all of these components, probably pretty quickly. We have 15 minutes left. And we'll start with the organization, or the core organization components, and I'll hand it over to Francesco and Kevin. So obviously coordination is very important if you're running a cluster of 64 nodes. Um, and of course, um, since we needed to do that, we essentially came up with like using one database to essentially store all the ground truth that we have. Um, as a bunch of you probably know, this is from Futurama. Um, so we just went with essentially Farnsworth because, well, good news, everyone. Um, and it's the only component that we actually tested fairly well at about 69% test coverage. I think the rest probably dumps around at like 1%. Um, Zero. Zero? Zero? Oh, perfect. Even better. Um, uh, who needs testing anyways, right? I mean, I've Anger has at least 15% code coverage. I think Francesco probably disagrees, but uh, eh, who cares? Um, then on top of that, we essentially had Meister, which the Germans in you know is essentially just master, um, which looks at scheduling jobs and deciding what jobs we want to run, what kind of part of our pipeline we want to run, exploits, patching, if we want to run AFL, these kind of things. 
uh, schedule them based on priority. And to this, obviously, sorry, the last component that we actually changed with the last commit being, I guess, two hours and 18 minutes before the actual deadline. So yeah, this was at 12.42, and the same deadline to actually the node shutdown was at 3 p.m. But we made a commit. I think we rolled that commit back 30 minutes before the deadline. Yeah, there were a bunch of commits at like 2 p.m., but we actually reverted them and cleaned up the history just to make sure that they're actually not there because they caused a bunch of failures on our side. Um, anyways, um, we would also like to give a big shout out to essentially the open source components that we essentially rely on. One of them is Python, the Microsoft Research Z3 compiler. All of our things run inside of Docker containers, which are running Ubuntu with PyPy. Um, we're also using Kubernetes, QAMU, Peewee, Vax, Postgres, obviously Angular, which I'm sure a bunch of people are going to talk about now. And I think that's probably Jan, possibly Sauls, Andrew, John, I guess, and Pizza. Yeah, go ahead. No, I want to say something. <laughs> I agree with everything he said. <laughs> Angers the open source binary project, binary analysis project that we have in the Sec Lab. It's really, really cool. It's been open source for like a year now. We released it at DEF CON last year, right? Yeah. Um, it does everything. It's cool. Um, no time. It's very cool. That's our logo. It's Creative Commons. Um, we, in order to do the actual exploitation and analysis pipeline, we split it up into a whole bunch of components and rearrange them into these weirdo things like we've used concolic execution in order to do some basic analysis of what can go where. There's automatic exploitation and patching, which will all be talked about. I think they've all got their sections in this presentation. Um, there's crashes. I think you can slow down a little. <laughs> so it's, it's a cat. Fine. Who wants to? Sorry. So who's cra who wants to talk about crashing? Crashing. Uh, guys, we haven't been sleeping for three days, so check I it out. I always talk we, we, I'm sorry if you're uh, friends with me. To all the funding agency, we're not doing drugs or alcohol. <laughs> Looks like it, but I'm we're not even not. 21. <laughs> all right, crashes. Souls, Nick, talk about it. You see how prepared we were for this huge DEF CON talk. Hello. Uh, so uh, crashing. Uh, so our exploitation strategy is we find crashes and we turn this into exploits. Uh, so pretty incredible. Uh, so actually, like a lot of teams, the thing we do the most is fuzzing, and this is what generates a lot, lots of test cases, lots of crashes. The majority of our crashes, but not entirely uh, all the goodies we find. So uh, we use AFL as our core component, uh, fuzzing. We, uh, I'm, we'll explain how AFL works like these slides do, I suppose, and uh, essentially be begins by generating lots of inputs which attempt to explore different parts of the program. Uh, the inputs are basically random. Uh, some of them are, are more or less educated guesses, and how well these inputs do in exploring the program is tracked by instrumentation which is uh, compiled into the binary or which is provided by uh, an emulator like QEMU. Um, so, let's see, did I go over all these? So, so AFL does a great job of doing this. We've modified it slightly to work better on CGC binaries. So we have a couple of hacks, which I think will be open sourcing, which make it perfect for CGC, or at least a lot better. Uh, okay. Uh, the uncrasher, I don't think that's actually, that actually exists. <laughs> but we... No, <laughs> I don't think there's an uncrasher, man. <laughs> the points of flag and all this shit. Yes. Rex, so one this is like karaoke slides. <laughs> right. Uh, I already mentioned this, right? AFL. It's great. This is how fuzzing works. Uh, random stuff gets put into the binary. Yep. Same input all over again. Eventually, it comes up with a random thing that works. This is much harder for a fuzzer. We have to generate a very specific input. Fuzzing will have no luck with this. Of, keeps continues to lose, uh, makes absolutely no progress. If you guys can't feel like you can't keep up with Mike Pizza, I feel like that very frequently. Okay, so Anger, on the other hand, is, is a symbolic execution engine. It's slower and more heavyweight, but it's great at finding very specific cases like the one we just described. And the way this works is by generating these states, following different paths. As you can see here in the control flow graph, we have different states which are being um, followed. Uh, eventually, there is a state which will satisfy the uwin expression, 
and we talk to Z3, we ask it to generate an input which gives us the state, and boom. So, what we tried to do is combine both AFL and anger, <laughs> and we, this is called driller. Driller begins by fuzzing, it gets basic code coverage of the program the way you would expect AFL to, it get, maybe gets a couple of test cases, in this example, X and Y. We get the cheap coverage. Next slide. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> then we take those test cases and we trace all of them with anger. So we make the input completely concrete, almost. We actually make it, keep it symbolic, but we constrain it to be this concrete input that AFL generated. And we see at any point in the program if we could have taken a different path, which AFL failed to take. If we could have taken that path, we talk to Z3 or anger more specifically, and we say, give me an input which satisfies this new path. In this case, we get the CGC magic. And a new test case is generated, and now we continue the loop and we feed this back into AFL which continues to mutate that further and fuzz and it goes on and on until we continue to get more code coverage. Uh, and then we play video games. All right, so this next part is the auto exploitation. How we go from a crash, which is generated by AFL and driller, to actually an exploit for the CGC which scores us a flag. All right, so in this example, I think there's a buffer, so there's a buffer overflow inside the he, inside this malloc object here. And when you overflow this buffer, you actually control the function pointer. And so we're inputting, inputting, inputting symbolic bytes, and eventually we control the buffer, the symbolic address. We're going to call in, into an address we control. And so to exploit this, we use anger. We check, we trace the input using anger and check that first the IP is symbolic. The PC here, we say, is the state, does the state have a symbolic PC? At that point, we know it's probably exploitable. We can control where we're going to jump to. And so let's set the buffer to contain our shellcode. We ask Z3 to give us input where the buffer pointing contains shellcode. And then we jump to the buffer. And that'll give us an exploit. Um, and to do this, we synthesize the input in an anger that's just called state.posix.dum0. So in the CGC, this is discovered by taking a crashing input and tracing that with anger. So keeping all the input that AFL created symbolic and then following the path that took until we have our crashing symbolic state. So right. keep in mind, this is very simplified. We have a bunch more techniques that handle the harder cases and that can take a not so good crash and turn into a better crash. And you can find those all when we do our open source release and when we release more details and papers later. And in the open source release, um, this component is called Rex. If you're interested in auto exploitation, check that out. All right, so then the, so the steps again, we create a vulnerable symbolic state where we control the PC. We add the constraints to set the shell code and to set the, the program counter to point to the shell code. And then we synthesize the input, and that creates our exploit. OK, so this, uh, this component will be talking about auto exploitation of flag leaks. So if you didn't know, there are two types of exploits you can generate in the CGC. The type one is sort of classic memory corruption, show that you can control the program uh, counter, and show that you can also control a general purpose register. Uh, however, there's another type called the type two, very creative, which uh, shows that you can leak arbitrary memory from the program. So in the CGC, there's actually a uh, sensitive, crypt, uh, sensitive data that's mapped at a special address or, uh, in every single binary. And if you can leak content from this page in memory, you score points. Like uh, Heartbleed, for example, when uh, there was a Heartbleed challenge in this game which, uh, where the premise was leaking this data from this flag page, the sensitive data. So the way we do this in the fast way is we actually use uh, the unicorn engine, which Anger in integrates, to make the entire input completely uh, concrete. The only thing which is symbolic during the flag leak detection is the flag page itself. So we trace the entire program and executes very fast because everything is being concretely e uh, emulated by QEMU with unicorn. And we can detect uh, and transmit, because we hook it with Anger, when the flag page is actually being emitted. And then we can see exactly which transformations are done to this flag page. You, we can tell if it's if been XORed or if some complicated constraints have been applied. For example, this actually solved the DEF CON CTF challenge, uh, which, <laughs> okay, we so don't have enough time to talk about that. But we solved the DEF CON CTF challenge this way, so. Oh, we'll, we'll talk about it a little more later. Patrick, oh, okay. So, uh, you have seven minutes. So, 
of course, one of the challenge was to patch this binary. So we had a component called patchrex that was going from patch, fr from unpatched binary to patch binary. So the general idea is we have patching techniques. For instance, let's add, let's encrypt the return address. And these patching techniques generate patches, such as let's add this code here, let's add this data there. And these patches were injected within the binary. We had three different ways. The first one was slower, but more reliable. And the last one was faster, but uh, less, a little bit less reliable. And Fish is probably going to talk about the reassembler. And so we had adversarial patches that were designed not to make uh, our binary, our patch binary, analyzable by others. And this is a one of them that is pretty cool. And um, this is a detect Quimu detection. This, if you run this code in Quimu, Quimu i3d6, it'll hang forever. Well, not really forever, as long as it takes to, int to increment a 64-bit int to the 64 times. That's basically forever. Um, and we actually owned the Cyber Grand Challenge um, visualization infrastructure with this. They're apparently using Quimu for instruction tracing. And so at one point during the CGC, we noticed that their instruction tracing had just stopped. And it stopped right on this code, which was designed to detect Quimu and crash. Well, not crash, but hang This forever. is a zero day. Take a picture. Uh, we have a lot of open source bug fixes to contribute starting now. <laughs> So there were other so, so, all, all sort of adversarial patches, so to speak. For instance, our binary was starting by transmitting the flag out, but uh, uh, they were transmitting to STDR, so, to, to STDR so that uh, this could probably confuse an analysis system that could misidentify this as a, as a type 2 vulnerability. We also have a backdoor that if some team was using our patch, uh, in, the, uh, in their uh, submission, we could actually exploit that. And I'm not sure if the backdoor worked during the CGC, but for sure it worked during the CTF. Yeah, how many uh, teams? During DEF CON. How many teams? I know fielded that our a lot of teams use our backdoor during. Uh, can can, can you name names? I'm no, sure. No, 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 no. It was no, three no. teams that fielded our backdoor at the CTF. During CGC? CTF. Ah, CTF. Okay, cool. So then we had also some sort of generic patches that are these are more standard academic things such as uh, protecting the return pointer, protecting direct calls, and when when we are going to release this uh, code, you will see all these sort of kind of more standard techniques, and then targeted patches. So the general idea. Oh, you can speak yeah. about so, something. So targeted patches, right? So qualification events. No. No, we, we just wanted to avoid crashes, right? Because uh, anything that crashes counts as an exploit. Yeah. So we had some, uh, you know, we just checked uh, using a weird quirk of one of the syscalls. Uh, uh, using a weird quirk of one of the syscalls, we checked to see if the uh, if memory was uh, readable at a certain point. If it wasn't, we crashed. So I would like to take sp specific credit for our no, back one slide for our targeted patches in the final event, which were exactly nil. And it worked great. So what, what can I say? And, it, and one note that... Uh, no functionality overhead. I thought it was a bug patching. in the slides. No, no, that was intentional. And one, one cool thing about this is that we, we thought we were cool uh, finding these uh, weird uh, syscall tricks to detect uh, memory allocations. But actually, when we analyze uh, uh, qualification binaries from other teams, when they were released, we found at least one other team was using exactly the same trick. So you're saying they were both cool? Yeah, we are both cool. Yeah. OK. Fish. So uh, we are running out of time. So what I, the only thing I want to say is uh, Angular is awesome. I spent three days in writing um, reassembler and another three days in writing optimizer. So it works out. So, so what is a reassembler? Just real quick. Reassembler is a static binary uh, rewriter that basically OK. We'll um, talk about it later. No, no, no. OK. Oh, it's fine. All right, we had a, a breakdown from our, I think, I think I just one of our, the our of the slide cloud. guys is, uh, <laughs> is um, it's fine. OK, it's fine. The reassembler is awesome. <laughs> Fish wrote a binary writer where you can inject code into binaries, and it'll it seamlessly the reassemble the binary to include that code. Check it out in the open source release. You go. No, there's nothing much to say. We basically, tried. So we, DARPA gave us 64 mm, powerful servers. Wait, how many servers? 64. 64? No, I'm not joking. 64. Holy shit. Not 30, 64. So we tried to maximize this usage, the usage of these nodes. 
And yeah, we kind of did it with the CPU at least. <laughs> Not the memory, but that's it. That's, that's it. So the 64 servers, we had a lot of media attention over the CGC. And uh, what, we got, what, what we got people excited about the most, strangely enough, is the fact that we had 64 servers all to ourselves. Incredible. Anyways, so we implemented all these systems in uh, breakneck like three months. Uh, and we pushed as hard as we could. We got it all running. We made commits at the last second. And we played the game. Or rather, our baby played the game. She walked on her own. We walked into the room. And they told us, hey, your guys' bot started up. And it's doing a lot of disk I.O. And we fucking lost it. Because until we freaking lost it. Because up until then, we thought, you know, it's going to turn on and something will fail and, and it'll all crap itself. So this was incredible. And then we got third place. Top three is amazing for us, guys. I can't, I can't tell you how incredible it is to have been part of this comp and we're going on. It was incredible. Since we played in the CTF, we didn't really get much of a chance to actually look at the data. Um, yeah. However, we quickly, briefly looked at it. So in total, there were 82 channel sends fielded. At least our bot saw only 82. So if more have been fielded, we might have actually missed them. In total, Mechanical Fish generated about 2,450 exploits. Um, we generated a total of 1,700 exploits for 14 out of the 82. Um, channel sets, all of them have 100% reliability insofar as a score, like always leaking or essentially um, crashing at a specific address. Did you check how many were like mostly reliable? Um, I did not. So okay. essentially it seems that we only got 14 out of 82 channel sets. We do not know how many essentially Gram Attack with Tech X and Xandra got or Mayhem with For All Secure. The rumors are that we have top exploitation, but we didn't have the best game theory. So like always, our SLA sucks. Our SLA is shit. And yeah, so in total, uh, can you back up one slide? Um, these are essentially the exploits that we actually generated some uh, actually, for. I, I should say the, the caveat to those rumors is Mayhem was only up half the game, and I think they still got almost as many exploits. So yeah. You know. yeah. And so we got two of the rematch challenges, so, so two of the historical challenges that DARPA introduced. One of them was SQL Slammer, which I think two other teams are also got, but don't quote me on that. And then there was also Crack Adder, which supposedly only we got right. And then in total, if you look at essentially the different challenges that we had and the vulnerabilities that were in there, this is the list of challenge sets that essentially we got. And with that, from all of us, yeah. thank you for the attention. Well. So real quick, let's talk about the next steps, real quick. The next steps beyond automated hacking is machines augmenting human intelligence. So in DEF CON CTF, we hooked up our CRS. Mayhem, as the winner, they played completely autonomously. We played with our CRS. So I mentioned already that the CRS actually pwned one binary without us even realizing it. It actually assisted us with five of the exploits. There were five exploits at which either after providing the crash um, or after just providing interaction, it created an exploit form. Um, and our CRS inserts back doors into every binary that it patches. And so you might have heard already that a lot of teams actually used our back door. This sounds all awesome, but we didn't win even close. Yes. We almost got close to last, and, so and, and, and let, let, let's turn down the bragging. Just, that, that's just, right. Just a tiny the bit. The CRS did amazing, but there were some issues. Like, for example, the DEF CON organizers had to implement a separate API for the infrastructure than DARPA did, right? Because the DARPA API had to be secret so that, you know, everyone was on an even, even playing field. And so there were some API incompatibilities, and computers are very brittle. And so these API incompatibilities screwed us until the very last day. So the last day, I feel we had a good showing. Up until then, the CRS kept crashing. The CRS kept getting invalid data. It was kind of touch and go. Um, so 
As you uh, might have heard, we're going to open source everything. We're going to do... Thank you. We, uh, we're going to do a full open source vomit because we believe in raising the playing field for everybody. So the next time a CGC runs around, rolls around, we expect all of you to play as well, hopefully using our stuff. So we don't uh, have it all ready right now to push to GitHub because we are playing the CTF. We thought we'd had time, but we don't. But Chris, do you think we can do a symbolic open sourcing of Angrop? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's do it right on stage. Uh, I'm going to unplug the video, Kevin, so Chris isn't logging in. Unless, I mean, just don't type your password into the wrong field. I've seen that before at DEF CON. It was incredible. It was someone fairly famous, too. Ah, there we go. Better safe than sorry. I think their password was star, 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 star. I enabled logging before. Psh. Chow Chow 4 is what Giovanni says. I think that's his password, though. All right, so we're going to plug it back in while we try to uh, desperately find the settings of the open source project. So Ngrop is our ROP compiler. So if you are tired of writing return-oriented programming payloads by hand, you can, wait, hold on, let me explain what it is. You can uh, use Angrop, which uses Angr, to compile ROP payloads into whatever you want. So you say, actually, just read this memory, or execute the syscall, and it figures out the ROP payload that it needs to generate. Chris wrote it, he's an amazing guy, and it's an amazing project, and here it is being open source for the world. Boom. <laughs> The rest of the code, we need to scrub free of uh, private keys because there are so depressingly many um, and other uh, depressing uh, things. And then we'll push it out this week. Also, if you find a private key that we haven't scrubbed, can you please gently let us know instead of yes, destroying our infrastructure? I, we will appreciate it. We're hackers. Hackers have some of the worst security in the world. So, and, and, and my password is six characters long, just to give you an idea. All right. Kevin, how do I get back to our uh, thing? But I think we're done, basically. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. So stay in touch. Hit us up on Twitter, by email. Jump on our IRC channel. You can chat with us about our CRS at Shellfish CRS and Freenode. I'm the only one there right now. It's super exclusive. Or on Anger at Freenode on Anger questions. Are there any actual questions? Yeah, hi. Uh, congratulations. Thank uh, you. On your uh, work. Um, so in your driller paper, you had said that uh, uh, the fuzzing was mostly responsible for 68 of the binaries, whereas uh, having the symbolic execution-based fuzzing only let you find uh, vulnerabilities in 11 more than that. So uh, is that still the case, or is the symbolic execution more effective than fuzzing now? You want to talk about Driller 3.0? Uh, sure. So one thing we've done to actually improve One thing, one thing we've done in actual, to actually improve uh, Driller, uh, especially on CGC binaries, is to identify functions and install SIM procedures uh, in their place. So what this means is that a lot of basic block transitions, which are hard for uh, or uninteresting for one symbolic execution solve, are more interesting when we have a SIM procedure. We can talk about it more if you want to come up here. Mike? Oh, last question. OK, well, uh, congrats, guys. Thank um, you. First. Uh, second, I wanted to know uh, how compute bound you felt. Like, were the, w did you get enough compute power, too little, too much? Would you have put something else in there? Backplane, RAM, what'd you think? So at this point, we don't actually know. 
because we haven't gotten a chance to actually look through all of the logs. Um, we had some problems in the very beginning, so actually on Wednesday still, to get all of our Kubernetes pods scheduled, simply because Kubernetes was not catching up. Um, we kind of solved that, but we at this point we don't really know what the status is insofar as the utilization of all the nodes. From but watching the power consumption, it seemed that the way that it dropped off, it seemed that it had a lot of unnecessary jobs that it would deschedule later. So I think we could have used a little less even, and, and it was still, yeah, we, we could have probably used 32 nodes and done about the same. But cool. the more the merrier, especially if you can schedule more jobs. We definitely had jobs to schedule that we couldn't schedule because of delays in Kubernetes. Cool. Thanks. All right, thank, thank you. you. And thank you for organizing Everybody, this thing. Please give Shellfish team a huge round of applause. What they've accomplished is immense. Thank you, guys. It was a dream come true to be here. Yes.